three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Well, thanks for joining us. As you see, Chris and I are sitting next to each other today. We're here to record Beyond the Stage at our partners with our partners, Advance Creative. They're great people to work with. Yes. My name my name is uh, Ruth Eggerman. I'm the director of marketing at Livermore Valley Arts, and I'm here with our host, Chris Carter. Hey, how you doing, Ruth? I'm good. I'm good. I'm super excited because we just finished an interview with uh, Tammy Jernigan an astronaut. She's the narrator of Cosmic Odyssey that's opening on October 14th. It's an immersive experience on the Bankhead stage where we're going to be in space. You're going to be as close as we can get to space. You're going to be in space. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. As close as we can get to space without leaving the earth. So what it is, by the way, is it's a structure that'll be on the stage of the Bankhead that you you get your ticket and you walk in and it's um, 40 feet long and 20 feet wide. It's huge. It's this big structure. You walk in, there's four walls. There's projectors on top. And there, um, you'll see uh, uh, these projections all around you, of uh, these images from NASA. Yeah. And it's, a, it's almost like a film and it, it's narrated by Tammy Jernigan. By Tammy yeah. Jernigan. Who we got to talk to today. So I know <laughs> I mentioned many times in the interview that I am – so geeked out about this and yeah. i part of that is because i look at our desire to be in the space race as a complete game changer and not just to be in the space race but to win the space mm-hmm. race and i think i'm convinced that our cell phones the 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 access we have in our pockets is as a, is a result of that journey that exploration yeah we had to, like these scientists and mechanical engineers and whatnot. They needed to figure it out, right? They needed to just figure it yeah. out. They didn't have a guidebook. They didn't have anything. I, that's crazy to me. It, like blows me away. <laughs> blows me away. So I don't know if you, um, I'm too young to remember the landing on the moon. Oh. Too young. Just just hair. <laughs> yeah, me too. Just by a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's such a bummer. <laughs> there's right because like all my siblings, like at least my my oldest sibling probably remembers it. And there's video. There's not video, but audio tape of a of New Year's Eve from from Jan, from from December of 1969 of my mom interviewing all of us and yeah. talking about the moon landing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was a big deal. And in, and they saved all the newspapers yeah. that came out from landing on the moon and tucked them away yeah. in a box and everything. I was negative six. Negative six. Yes, I don't remember it. I was three. <laughs> <laughs> I was three. I'm sure I loved every minute yeah. of it. <laughs> But I just don't remember. Yeah. So as, right. as, you, as you've gathered, we're talking today, and we'd love for you to stick around and um, listen to this interview with Tammy Jernigan, who was an astronaut, currently works at the Livermore Lab, right? Yes, she yeah. does. And, um, and then she's the one who's narrating the cosmic odyssey exploration that's happening at the bank hat and that is opening october 14th and it's running through november 27th and uh you can get tickets at livermorearts.org or by calling the box office at 925-373-6800 so stay tuned for tammy jernigan two one zero all Hey, Tammy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm so happy you're here. And we also have Angie and Cola with us today, too. Hey, Ann, how are you? Great, happy to be here. Ann is the producer of our exhibit, and Tammy is the star of our Cosmic Odyssey exhibit, uh, which we're going to talk about. Um, but uh, a couple things. Well, she's she's the star who is introducing us to the stars. To the star. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody came up with that. Thank you. Good job. Um, but Tammy, I don't know if you know, we do have something in common in that um, I believe your son and our my sons are wearing the same Boy Scout troop. Is that right? 
Troop 911. Troop 911. Yes. Yeah. That's absolutely true. <laughs> so my son was a young Boy Scout when your son got his eagle. And um, my old, my younger one is still in the troop, but I, we've been in that troop for a long time. Um, but uh, I remember, I believe he was pretty young when he got his eagle. Yeah, he was 14. Wow. Oh, wait, I think Crazy. he bragged about <laughs> this this young man who got his I eagle don't know scout of 14. I've been in scouts for a long time, for like four, thir- probably, you know, 13 or 14 years. And I don't, I think that's the youngest eagle scout I've ever seen come through. So that was very impressive. No, he, it was a wonderful experience for him. Yeah. We really um, loved the scouting experience and the leadership in Troop 911. My son, my husband was actually an assistant um, scout yeah. leader, but just the leadership and the, the men who volunteered in the scout troop and the um, some of the moms also um, mm-hmm. in supporting roles, it was a fabulous experience for him. So, Well, I'm glad we have that in common. Yes. Um, well, tell him hi for us. I will. I'd be happy <laughs> yeah. to. And uh, so you're you're a train you're an astrophysicist or physicist, right? So my PhD is in uh, physics and space physics, and um, I studied. I had an astrophysics topic. I studied radiation produced by interstellar shock waves, as a diagnostic for understanding the underlying physics of things like supernova, for example. That's exactly what I was studying in college. No, I, was, I, was I, know, I, was, I was like, did you hear that airplane go over my head? <laughs> really? I'm sure we have a lot of very smart listeners that would um, <laughs> that'll help us appreciate a deeper conversation about that. And then, but that was so you, but you were an astronaut too. So I was selected as an astronaut while I was getting a PhD at Berkeley in astrophysics. Mm-hmm. And then during the course of my training, I transferred to Rice, and I finished my PhD in space physics at Rice while training for mm-hmm. for the space program. And How, so, come back to this: getting selected. So you applied, right? They didn't just pick your name out of a hat. That's right? correct. I applied. So, so how long was that process? And you were still able to continue education. So, from the time that you were selected till you went up in space. The first time, what was that like? So when you're selected as an astronaut, um, you apply. It's a very lengthy application. And one thing that probably distinguishes that selection process from others is a, a very lengthy medical examination. So you certainly do interviews. You have social events. Um, they want to make sure that you enjoy people and you get along with people. Um, and then months go by, and then you find out that you've been selected. And so you then you go to Houston and you train for a year. You're called an astronaut candidate for a year. And you train on oral the orbiter systems. You travel to different NASA centers and get familiar with the NASA programs in general and specifically the shuttle program. And then you're assigned a flight. Now, for me, the Challenger accident occurred six months after I arrived. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so there was a delay. So yeah. there was a delay in assignments. But then in addition to that, when I had interviewed, they asked me about finishing my Ph.D. And I said, absolutely, I, I'm going to finish my Ph.D. Um, so the first few years were pretty challenging to finish my Ph.D. and then um, do all my preparation for flight assignment. Mm-hmm. But I finished my degree before I was assigned my first flight. And, and what inspired you to apply? Well, when I was young, I always enjoyed science and math, but I always wanted to fly. I always had a desire to fly. And so the astronaut program combined all those interests, yeah. right? Scientific interests, you know, the adventure of flying in space and exploring in space. So for me, it was just a fabulous opportunity. But I was smart enough to know that, you know, there's a real element of good fortune in getting selected for something like that. And so... Because I had a passion for science and math, I was pursuing a degree in physics and then later got interested in astrophysics and thought, you know, I'm going to pursue this career in science and I'm going to apply to the astronaut program and maybe someday I might be fortunate enough to be selected. Can So you only applied the one time? No, I applied twice. The first okay. time I applied, I was 23. Um, and I got encouraged to take a position um, at NASA in Houston, and I said that I wanted to stay and continue to finish my work on my PhD. And so then I got interviewed the second time um, a year later, and 
then was fortunate enough to be selected. So I was in the class of 85. So. Okay. So, you, and I'm sorry, I'm, I, I am truly fascinated and geeked out by, by <laughs> this whole experience. I am in awe of the whole space program. And so um, I'm curious, did you have to fill out the whole application, go through the medical exams all Absolutely. over again? Absolutely. You're, so, you're starting over. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay. Go and ahead, Chris. And the physical <laughs> must have been a challenge because they... You know, the, they have to go to anti-gravity stuff and all the physical Did side they, of it must have been super challenging. Yeah, so it's, so it's more just when you do such a wide range of medical experiments and te medical testing, um, you know, your concern is that something is going to be out of limits or out of bounds. I think that's the biggest concern. It's not really like the movie The Right Stuff where, you know, they're putting you in these three dimensional trainers and spinning you up. Um, it's more really about testing your cardiovascular system and your pulmonary system and a lot of eyesight tests and hearing and things like that, making sure you're not claustrophobic. Um, oh, tell us about that was, test. <laughs> what did you have to do to make sure you weren't claustrophobic? Well, actually, um, my your interview with about 20 people. And so we had gone out the night before, you know, to share stories of what our days were like with interviews. And so I had stayed out quite late. So my uh, claustrophobia test was the next morning and actually fell asleep in the little sphere they zip you up to see if you're oh. claustrophobic. So you I passed, passed that test like pretty a... easily. <laughs> you passed it because you passed out. <laughs> just, I just needed a nap. <laughs> well, can we back up a little bit? So where, where did you grow up? So I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but uh -huh. I grew up in Southern California. Southern California. And then was there a moment like in your youth where you were really kind of, do you remember like the first time you really were into science or like what was, did you have a, a collect anything or like what was it that kind of got you going? I think I, I can't remember a time that I didn't like science and math, but I had one memory when I was 10 is when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember going outside and looking at the moon and being fascinated by the idea that this celestial body I'm looking at has a human being standing yeah. on its surface. And I was fascinated by that idea. And I think that's really when I thought perhaps, you know, someday I would I would throw my hat in the ring for the astronaut program. And were there people in your life that helped kind of inspire you or... Um, supported you through this process? So even though no one in my family had ever gone to college, my mother certainly encouraged me to go to college. Yeah. And then I had teachers um, who encouraged me and fostered my love of science, both, you know, elementary school and in college. Um, I had a volleyball coach in high school who I, I very much liked athletics also, who was very demanding and really taught me you know, disciplined and the importance of, um, you know, being in shape and following through with commitments. Mm -hmm. And so she was a very um, dynamic person um, and influential in my life. And then when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, I got an internship at Ames Research Center and had also worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I had great mentors there who really helped me understand what research looked like. Yeah. And got me in a research lab, um, which allowed me to understand what being a scientist really meant. And then when you, um, so you did research while you were on your missions, right? Is it? That's what correct. Did, what was your uh, What was your job? So I flew five times. Mm -hmm. So on my first flight, we were a biomedical research flight. So we wanted to understand the effects of space flight on the human body. So we did cardiovascular experiments, pulmonary experiments. We looked at the immune system. So I had two jobs. During ASCIN and entry, I was the flight engineer. And then during the nine-day mission, I performed medical experiments and was also a subject of some of the experiments. Yeah. And then my second flight, we studied um, heat transfer in space and deployed satellites. My third flight actually touched upon my background in astronomy and astrophysics, my third flight, we flew a suite of ultraviolet telescopes. And so we want to, when you look in the ultraviolet, you want to get out of the Earth's atmosphere because it blocks the ultraviolet radiation. Mm -hmm. So we looked at stars and galaxies and planets. We looked at the signature of primordial helium left over from the Big Bang. So we had an 18-day mission 
and ran that observatory 24-7. And then my fourth flight, again, we did a series of um, uh, thermal experiments and biological experiments. We deployed satellites. And then on my fifth flight, it was a space station construction mission. So I was able to do my first spacewalk, Mm -hmm. flew the robot arm. So over a course of five space flights, you have a wide range of experiences and a wide range of scientific and engineering endeavors. What was um, the outcome of some of those experiments? Is there anything that's that's changed because of what you did or any new knowledge that's been gained? Or We certainly gained a better understanding of human adaptation to spaceflight after mm-hmm. the biomedical research flight. Um, we have satellites in orbit um, that return information about the Earth's atmosphere. We... Um, you know, facilitated expanding the space station. We saw evidence of primordial helium during my third flight. So those are just some of the discoveries during those missions. Yeah. So primordial helium, that comes from the Big Bang, right? Correct. And there's not an infinite amount of it. Is this what we use like in balloons and surgery and and all of that kind of stuff? Sure. It's the he- same thing? Yeah, helium is helium. Okay. And so <laughs> in the early universe, it's thought was made up of hydrogen and helium. And the way that you get um, heavier elements is you fuse them in stars once stars form. Okay. And these telescopes that you went up, did, were they outside of the space station and you launched them? This so their- they were in the cargo bay of the space shuttle. So as the space shuttle orbits the Earth, you have a pointing system that points this telescope at various celestial objects, and then you take data. And you move the telescope from object to object, you know, 24-7 um, to meet the scientific goals of each of the observations. Wait, is that hard to do while you're in space? Because when you're, you're on the ground, you can have a telescope and it's, like, fixed, right? So you're but just you're issuing commands um, through a keyboard. Okay right, to maneuver the instrument pointing system okay, and issuing commands um, to start making the observations, to terminate the ob- observations, to move the telescope to the next target, to the next galaxy or star or whatever it is you might be looking at. Did you ever see anything weird? Or, I ne- or is it confidential? I you never said talk about it. <laughs> That's a very frequently asked question. I never saw anything that we didn't understand. Yeah. And anything now that super surprises you, like, I can't believe they discovered that, or I can't believe that happened? I think the whole experience in general is somewhat surreal, because it's so outside of your normal experience base. And sometimes I'll see a clip from a flight I was on, and, and I'll think, my goodness, that was something. It fills me with such a sense of privilege that I was able to do that and able to take part in the adventure of space exploration. Yeah, it's... It's huge. I mean, like the questions that I have are really about that experience and the human experience of experiencing space and how that may have changed everything for you. And you were young when you did it. You were in your, sounds like you were in your 20s. So I, my first flight, though, was when I was 30 because so of the, okay. the, we had a delay with the, after the Challenger accident. Yeah. And that's because I, I was, you know, looking up some facts about you and I was like, oh, it was 1985. She started. As an astronaut, that she must have been in the program or entering the program at that exact same time, because I remember that very clearly when Challenger exploded. In fact, the school that my my children went to was named after Krista McAuliffe. So, you know, I mean, it's a it's a huge experience, and then to still go into the program and feel confident must have been. How, yeah, how did that how did that affect you? I mean, because you're in the program, and then this terrible tragedy happens. Um, that must have had a, a big impact on Well, I think everything. the first thing, of course, is that, you know, you've lost now people you really care about, yeah. right? And so there's that sense of human loss. But then there's a sense of we need to figure out what happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very much understanding what the failure was and, of course, understanding how to make sure that this never happens again. But there was never a time it entered my mind that the program wouldn't continue or that I wouldn't continue in the program. I, I never had a thought like that. And I got asked that question by family, by friends who were concerned. And I said, you know, NASA, we will figure out what happened and we will make sure that, that we don't repeat this. But space exploration is, is a challenging enterprise. Mm-hmm. That is certainly true. 
but um, there are also tremendous rewards. So you, it's a risk benefit analysis. You weigh it. Yeah. You bet. Was well, it as in, awe inspiring as it sounds to go, look down on Earth? I, I think the view of, of Earth from the vantage point of space is extraordinary. And you do have this sense, and you will hear, I've never heard anyone who flew in space who didn't say this. You have this sense of there are no boundaries. We are all in this planet together. For goodness sake, we need to get along. Yeah. And we need to be good stewards of our home planet. Right. We, we need to be good stewards of our planet. So should we just take every world leader and important person up into space at least once and just yeah. give them that perspective? <laughs> Would that help? I certainly think that, um, I mean, th this Cosmic Odyssey program that's being done now, I think giving people an appreciation for, you know, our place in the universe yeah. and the fragility of Earth um, and where we are with respect to the rest of the cosmos, I, I do think it helps expand people's understanding mm -hmm. um, of our responsibility yeah. um, to be good citizens of our, of our planet. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Cosmic Odyssey for a minute since you brought it up. Um, so you're the voice that we're gonna, that's going to be there for the Cosmic Odyssey. Anne is uh, producing this and putting this together. And you said you just saw the script today? This morning. This morning. The whole video. The whole video. And what, what's your first impression? I thought it was extraordinary. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Just not even looking at it from the point of view of somebody who will narrate, but from the point of view of uh, someone who just enjoys hearing about the history of space exploration, mm -hmm. seeing those extraordinary visuals um, from all the NASA missions over the last 50 years. I found it very inspirational. So I, I really enjoyed it just as someone who to come and watch. Yeah. So, it, so I have a question. So when you're, you've seen the video now and you've also been in space, do the, do the pictures do it justice at all? I, I think they do. I okay. think they do. Especially in the format, the immersive format that's planned for Cosmic Odyssey. I think people will really get a sense of, you know, a feeling of maybe they're out there, at, at least to some small extent. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's the idea. You know, right. you're going to be here in this large space and projections are going to be all around you. They're all from NASA. They're moving. Uh, somebody's giving you uh, more information about what you're seeing. And it's supposed to give you some perspective, too. So I think um, it's been captured really well. So, and, and then coming from a, someone who's actually been into space who said, yeah, I like it. That's, <laughs> that's how I did. That's I, reaffirming. I, I was yeah. like sweating. Like, I hope you like it. Uh, no, I, 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 very, I very much enjoyed it. And for me, it was a walk down memory lane because yeah. I've been involved in NASA since I was 19. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't give you a sense. I felt like we wanted to impart that the wonder of why are humans looking up there like, you know, that you, you are so intrigued with it. So I felt like we wanted to to tap into that, that everybody is interested. Well, I think that, uh, especially at the beginning of the video where there's a discussion about how all peoples looked to the heavens and wondered um, what's out there and tried to understand the movement of the stars mm -hmm. and the different celestial objects, you know, since the recorded history, there's since recorded history, there's been this fascination um, with the topic. And yet it feels like we, for as much as we know, we there's probably more that we don't know, right? Well, it's certainly true that, uh, you know, I again, I remember, I hearken back to Voyager. Every time they got close to another planet, they would upend a whole set of theories about planetary formation or solar system formation. So we certainly learn as we go, but we also open the door for new questions and, and more understanding. And that's the scientific approach too, right? Absolutely. To be open to new ideas. That's right. And, and to be okay to be wrong. We used to say only a person with a mind can change it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Or just posing a, a thesis on what caused something or other black hole and then and then being able to get more information to describe it a that's, little better. That's right. That brings up the important, you know, point of the importance of some kind of test. Mm -hmm. You know, a theory is as good as your ability to test it. So you want to make sure that there's something you can observe or some experiment you can run 
that tests the validity of the theory mm -hmm. to see whether or not it should stand the test of time or whether or not we have it wrong and we need to adjust our thinking to a theory that we can then test again and see whether or not that theory is valid. Have you ever seen, do you ever, there's a show called The Big Bang Theory. Yes. Have you ever watched that? I have. Uh, we love that show at my house. And there's something about it, and it's because they're scientists, that's different than every other show, is where one character might be presented with some new evidence that shows that they're wrong about something, and they go, oh, okay, and they change their viewpoint. And it's just, it doesn't matter how um, off the wall it is, but like, it, when they're presented with new evidence, it makes them move forward and change their mind as the character. And it seems like most people, when they're presented with new evidence, have a hard time still changing their mind, which I love about the scientific method and the scientific approach. It just seems like a, a better way to uh, kind of interpret your world. Well, I think we all have to be careful, right, about this idea of confirmation bias, that, yeah. that we don't just embrace information that already confirms what we believe, but that we're able to objectively look at data and say, um, how do we incorporate this new information and make yeah. sure that our ideas and we're flexible enough to adjust our ideas based on the new information. Yeah. That's how we advance the human humankind. But it's hard. Right? It's, it's it, hard yeah. for us to do that. It's I know interesting it's hard for me. because if you were talking about science or math or things that seem to have a definitive answer, right? That seems to work. Like I can easily pick that up and put it down by me, right? What you're saying. What I think gets confusing with this confirmation bias is when it's not so clear cut when you're talking sometimes about human emotion or experience or, you know, different things like that. How do you incorporate that scientific method into life as we move forward through the day and experience new things and learn new information? I mean, and I don't know that you have the answer. I'm just sort of posing the question. <laughs> That, I think physics is a lot easier, right? Than, right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe for you. Than dealing with yeah. a human, yeah. dealing with the human side of it. But no, I think, you know, I think we always have to ask ourselves, you know, this question: If I keep doing the same thing, I shouldn't be stunned that I'm getting the same results. Yeah. And if that result isn't desired, maybe I need to adjust my approach. Yeah, exactly. That's the only thing I might suggest. Yeah. <laughs> what to okay. you is the most um, burning question that either they're working on in space exploration at this point? Oh, I, I think it's very difficult to find one, you know, holy grail of questions because I think there's so many. But I think I think understanding the origins of the universe mm -hmm. and its vastness, I think understanding um, life outside of our solar system, um, you know, we have billions of stars in each and what's probably billions of galaxies somewhere out there, Um it seems to me there's there's life outside of our solar system. You know, will we ever have a connection, have a signal that indicates that definitively? I think those are really important questions. And, you know, how our solar system formed. I mean, there are just so many interesting questions about the cosmos well, and also I, questions about life here on Earth. I, I read recently that the Webb telescope is like starting to upend a lot of what we thought we knew again be, and one of the examples was it's uh it's getting images of these galaxies from essentially close to the beginning of, t of time and they're a lot more well formed than they should be and so it's like you're looking at something that's supposed to be this this old but it's acting like something that's way older and so they're now they're trying to figure out why does why is that happening or what's what's going on there yeah so that would make a scientist relook at theory of ga galactic evolution for mm -hmm. example yeah it's fascinating so that yeah it's like the more you the more you know the more you don't know <laughs> right i guess is that's is that i the think lesson? there's i think there's some truth in that yeah yeah well and then what's next uh, like for as far as space exploration i know there's a planned trip to mars at some point but uh, what do you see as like the future of space exploration in the next you know 10 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Well, right now, NASA's on a program to do missions that return to the moon. 
and then eventually on to Mars. Mm -hmm. And so I and I and I think that is it's an extraordinary challenge. It's a challenge technically, but it's also a challenge to, you know, keep a program over multiple administrations and um, secure funding and keep continuity. So I think that will be something NASA will be, you know, heavily involved in for the foreseeable future mm -hmm. is, is going back to Mars. But I've never given a talk at a school where kids weren't excited about the idea of going back to Mars. I think that's something that's going to be on our radar screen until we, until we achieve that goal. Yeah. And then in, in parallel, of course, are all the the telescope, you just mentioned the James Webb telescope, right? All of the programs where we send telescopes out much further than we can send humans to explore the universe. And I, I see those programs as complementary. Mm -hmm. Some of NASA's programs will involve human exploration, and some of NASA's programs will involve exploration where humans aren't on board the spacecraft, but they, they do all of their um, learning on the ground, mm -hmm. right? As they get all of these images and all of this data back on Earth and try to make sense of it. And if NASA came back to you and said, hey, Tammy, we have another mission for you, would you do it? <laughs> I think that my five flights, I'm satisfied You've with my enough. five flights. <laughs> <laughs> right, because remember, there's a training program associated with each flight, yeah. right? And you're done so, with the training. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it is. No, no. I, I mean, the training is very interesting in many, interesting in many ways. But I also think that you know, it's for this current generation of astronauts to go and explore. Yeah. They're right. They're the ones that are making the sacrifices. They're the ones who are. I mean, they're doing it gladly. Mm -hmm. But still, they're the ones working hard and taking the risks that. Um, that are involved in space exploration. Yeah. So I, I leave it to them, Let them to be the explorers of today. That's great. And your husband is an astronaut as well. He was. He um, he and I um, were in the program together. We overlapped for a number of years, and he flew on uh, four space flights. So you've been in space more than him. I have, but he's done more space walks. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you call it even. We do. We call it even. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for you. So... For Cosmic Odyssey, we'll have the visuals and you'll be walking us through this, through your narration. If there was a smell to, to pump into the room, what would that smell be? And if there was a touch or something that we could pump into the room, what would that be? Or even any other type of sense or feeling? I think for me, it's just about having a fabulous sound system. Okay. So you can sort of feel the sound reverberate. Yeah. I think that would be um, what would be most meaningful to me as I, as somebody who watched the video um, and was immersed in that, it would be having a great sound system. Yeah. yeah. Zero Did, gravity. Do you think we, you, we can yeah, yeah. Yeah. zero gravity in there? Yeah. If all, if all of your participants could float, then that would make <laughs> it more realistic. <laughs> Get on that, Anne. <laughs> I'll work on that. We could put them in a pool. Um. Is, it, is it all like being in a pool? Well, remember, the pool, you have to work against the viscosity of the water. Right. Whereas so you're just floating. There's nothing just, pushing you back. Right. So NASA uses a pool to train astronauts. For spacewalks, for example. Mm -hmm. So you make the spacesuit neutrally buoyant and you go and you practice the activities in this very, very large pool uh, that, that you're going to do on orbit. Mm -hmm. So that, but, but it's different in the sense that you move so effortlessly in space, even in a suit that weighs hundreds of pounds, whereas in the water you have to work to move. Yeah. What was that so, like on your first spacewalk? Was, Were you scared? I was, it was very exciting. Yeah. Um, you're just, you're so focused on accomplishing the goals of the mission, right? We were removing tooling and cranes and things from mm -hmm. the cargo bay of our space shuttle and attaching them to the space station. We wanted to make sure all that went well because each step in a construction is important for the, for progress for the next flight. Mm -hmm. But the view of earth from outside the spaceship is, is just so yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Even, um. Even the pictures of that are extraordinary, and to, to experience that firsthand, and the aurora. that blows me away. Yeah. It blows me away. And yeah. the aurora, just seeing the aurora yeah. from yeah. the vantage point of space, or seeing lightning. You know, when you have this large scale view of the planet, it's amazing how there seems to be lightning activity somewhere on the planet, such a high percentage of the time. Wow! Wow! wow. 
And and the whole time you were up in space, were you always was the Earth always in view to you? Yes. I, I have to ask if if you go to, to watch a, like a science fiction movie now and they're like in space, are you just like, oh, that's wrong. That's not no, they didn't do that right. <laughs> Yeah. Do you do that? It's hard not to. It's hard to not do that. Yeah. <laughs> you got you yeah. to be critical. Are there any? But you movies, can still enjoy it. Are there any movies that have done a good job? I think, other than the opening scene, I really liked Martian. Martian. Yeah. So the scene yeah. that sets up, um, the character being mm-hmm. left on the surface, that's not realistic because mm-hmm. Martians don't have that kind of atmosphere. Oh, okay. But in general, I thought that movie did a good job on touching on a lot of the themes. So I think that in a number of these movies, there are elements of the movie that are realistic. Mm-hmm. And there are other elements where they really took dramatic license because yeah. they had to, right? Because they're they're entertaining. They're moving the story along. You bet. Um, well, can we talk just real quick and then we'll wrap it up. But um, this Cosmic Odyssey experience, for me, it's... It's bringing together art and science. And um, do you have like any kind of thoughts on like how, because sometimes people think they don't, they don't, they can't coexist. Like there's art over here and there's science over here. How, how does that overlap for you? And, and what does it mean to have art and science together? I think that in my field, astronomy and astrophysics, I mean, it is filled with artist concepts, right? Based on scientific data. So communicating through art has been foundational to understanding the science um, mm-hmm. in astrophysics. So I, I think they're very much intertwined, and yeah. I think it's an extraordinary communication tool, a, a visualization tool, and just a way to further your understanding of the physics of an object. So I see them as intertwined. Oh, thank you. Do you all have any other questions? Oh, I have a ton. You do? <laughs> I, we've talked a lot about perspective and and how going to space and or going even just going to Cosmic Odyssey can help us understand more about ourselves and more about our own planet. And I'm curious how it has changed your perspective to go out into space with regards to, you know, even things like being a parent, being in a marriage, being, you know, like that kind of stuff. Has it had any impact or lasting impact that it that you really changed your perspective on things. I think as I as I mentioned before, it's just this idea of seeing this earth, this lone orb suspended in the darkness, to see this very thin atmosphere that protects us. That's what we have as a people on earth and that we need to protect our earth. We need to be good stewards of our earth. Just one visual that stuck in my mind is during my first flight, we saw the Kuwaiti oil fires Mm -hmm. that Saddam Hussein had um, ordered, right? And those oil fires dumped very noxious smoke into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And you could see that very clearly from space. And it seemed like such a crime against humanity, right, that that because of this war, we were dumping these noxious chemicals into space that that pollutes the entire earth at some level. And I remember being really struck by that image Mm. and thinking, and of course, as a parent, right, I want to leave a, a, a healthy home for my children. And so it only highlights the importance of really being good stewards of the planet. Yeah, that's fair. I what would you say to the astronauts that are stuck out in space today or, you know, the, it seems like it could be a year before they're. So I don't think of the astronauts as being stuck. Oh, uh-huh. okay. I think that, you know, NASA plans for these kind of contingencies, right? So they arrive safely to the space station, but there were issues with the thrusters. There are some issues with leaks that they don't quite fully understand as, as I understand it. And so, they're not comfortable, right, mm-hmm. sending that crew back. But there's plenty of good work to be done. NASA plans for contingencies. Um, and so they'll keep researching the problems and testing the issues with the Starliner and decide whether or not it's safe to send the two crew members home. 
but they'll have a ride home. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll get home eventually. And, and also, you know, having more time in space is pretty exciting. Yeah. So I, I don't think they view it so much as being stuck, but just that this was a contingency they planned for, and this is something that NASA will have to work its way through. Yeah. Much like they did, like, probably with every space flight. But I mean, we've all well, seen like the, we've all seen Apollo thirteen. I'm just, I'm well, guessing. <laughs> and like like the movie you talked about, The Martian. It's just like, well, when you're presented with a problem, you got to solve it. And every time there's a problem, right. you got to figure it out. And that's just you just how you approach. It's a good way to approach life too, or your job, or anything else. When there's a problem, you face it, you figure it out, and you solve it, and you move on to the next problem. And I think this idea that when something happens unexpected, right, or undesirable, that, you know, what's left to you is how do I choose to handle it, mm -hmm. right? It's right. all we can control. Right. So so on board, they're going to go, and they're going to make the most of that mission. They're going to do more science. They're going to get more done on station while they figure out when is the appropriate time to bring the, the two Starliner crew members home. But somebody told me once, bad news is good news if you approach it the right way. So there's always, like you said, silver linings, right? Um, anything else? Well, I just want to say that we super appreciate how easy you've been to agree to presenting this for the community because yeah. we feel very strongly that we're bringing arts to our community. And um, it was it was been super great that you are so accommodating and very excited to have you do our vo voiceover. And I think school children are going to love this. And yeah. uh, it's going to be yeah, super we're very important. grateful. Thank you. Yeah, my um, my pleasure. It's a very worthy mission. I'm pleased to be part of it. Well, before you go, so we do whenever we do these podcasts, we do a little game with our our guests. It's super easy. I hope you're okay with it. Uh, but it's a way to get to know you better. And so it's we call it either or. So I'll give you like a, a series of uh, two things and you pick which one you prefer. Okay. Right. So very easy. So if I was to say sunrise or sunset, what would you say? Sunset. Sunset. Cats or dogs? Dogs. You're going to get through this fast. <laughs> um, Do you have a dog? Yes. <laughs> what's your dog's name? Astro? Case Casey. Casey. All right. <laughs> Uh, pineapple on pizza or no pineapple on pizza? No pineapple. Nope. What is wrong with people? <laughs> You're not it's the first so one good. to say it. It's so good. It's so good. Um, that's okay. Uh, breakfast for dinner or dinner for breakfast? Dinner for breakfast. Ah, absolutely. Um, the book or the movie? The book. Uh, clean desk or a messy desk? Clean desk. Clean desk. <laughs> Don't um, invite her to my office. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, well, I, I looked up your education background, so I'm going to say Stanford or Cal. Stanford. Ooh, that was super easy. Well, for because you. I played volleyball at Stanford, and so that athletic <laughs> loyalty is very difficult to break. <laughs> did you watch the volleyball in the Olympics this Absolutely. year? Absolutely. The women did a pretty good job, didn't they? Well, they took the silver. Right? Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Took the silver. Uh, this is a music question. Jazz or blues? That's the hardest question you've asked me. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, jazz. Jazz. They're gonna get harder. I got space questions now. Uh, space pirates or space ninjas? <laughs> space pirates. Space pirates. You know, there's a movie called Space Pirates that came out in the '80s. Super funny movie. You should watch it. There's also a movie called like Space Cowboys. Space isn't Cowboys. There? Um, we should, next we could do that. Space pirates or space cowboys. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> Uh, astronaut ice cream or ice cream from the Metal Ark Dairy? Oh, my goodness, the dairy. The dairy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for people who may be out of town listening, the Metal Ark Dairy is a, a ice cream place in Pleasanton that um, was ranked by Yelp as one of the top 10 ice cream joints in the country. And they've rerouted traffic yeah. just to get there. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Star Wars. But my husband would say Star Trek. But isn't Star Trek more a divided accurate? family? <laughs> like sci from a scientific scientific perspective, Star Wars is probably much, or Star Trek is probably more accurate. You're not wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, Star Wars is more fun. It makes me want to ask you this question: Star Trek or Star Wars? <laughs> um, Star Wars, absolutely. Um, so here, these are two physicists, because Al you're a physicist: Albert Einstein or Isaac Newton. Einstein. Einstein. Okay, string theory or quantum field theory? Quantum field theory. 
Wow. Yeah. Such a good test taker. <laughs> right. Um, spacewalk or moonwalk? As in Michael Jackson's moonwalk. Oh, no. Oh. Spacewalk. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's not even I thought you meant <laughs> actually being Wait, on the okay, moon. Okay, space, let's do that. Yeah, spacewalk. Then do a moonwalk and spacewalk. Spacewalk or a moonwalk? I would say actually being on the moon, yes. Okay, moonwalk. Uh, and my last one is uh, Cosmic Odyssey at the Bankhead uh, this fall or anywhere else in the world while that's running. Oh, Cosmic, cosmic Odyssey. Cosmic Odyssey. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tammy. We're so pleased to have you and uh, grateful that you're a part of this and looking forward to the show. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you right. so much for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us for Beyond the Stage featuring Tammy Jernigan, who's going to be the sound of... Uh, the Voice of Cosmic Odyssey, and that's an immersive experience with the universe, and it's happening on the Bankhead stage October 14th through November 27th. It's like Mondays through Thursdays, starting at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. They start on the hour every hour and run about 40, 45 mm -hmm. minutes. Then we follow it up with um, some facilitation and moderation from... Um, scientists who will answer questions after the experience. So get your tickets now at livermorearts.org or by calling our box office at 925-373-6800. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ruth Hegerman. And I'm Chris Carter. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you in space. That's one small step for man.